Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them this morning, leading us in worship. You know, we're always uh, blessed by them. And uh, how many of you know I'm up to preach a little bit early this morning? Would y'all slip your hand up? All right, you good Baptist. You're like, what's going on with this place, man? And uh, deal is, uh, I'm actually headed to Dahlonega after this service. So you guys are going to worship a little more. But uh, it's pretty awesome to be able to see what the Lord's doing through our fellowship. Uh, and throughout the month of July, one of the things that I wanted to do was not only this series, but also visit our uh, church campuses. And that's why I've been over in Habersham and Mount Yon, and today I'll be in Dahlonega. But y'all just continue to pray because every time I go, I have an opportunity to meet new people, also have an opportunity to hear new stories, and uh, it's awesome to see how the Lord's changing people's lives, and we're a part of that. And uh, excited this morning just to be able to continue this particular series entitled Let's Go. And if you guys will turn me down in the monitor just a little bit, that would be awesome because I'm yelling at myself. Are you listening? Hey, now here's an awesome uh, win for you, okay? Sometimes uh, summertime rolls around for those of us on staff, and we're like, good night, the church is not doing well because we come in and we see all the empty seats, right? Look like the rapture happened, and maybe we missed it. You with me? But uh, interesting, so what we did is we kind of ran a data report on our fellowship from 2015 to 2017, and we only looked at two months, the months of June and July. We wanted to measure them to see how we've been doing uh, for the past few years. And this is absolutely phenomenal. In 2015, we were running roughly 800 people in worship. In 2017, we're running roughly 1,100 people in worship. Isn't that crazy? Just over three years of summer. Are y'all golf clapping? I don't even feel it. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a 26% increase. And much of that is due to the fact that we have focused our attention on starting these new church campuses. And you're a part of that. You know, we cast a vision three years ago, 777. The goal was, in the context of seven years, to start seven new church campuses and be involved in seven countries internationally. And so we're already seeing some of the fruit of that labor. And we're reaching individuals in northeast Georgia that we would never have had an opportunity to reach had we not started those new church campuses. And so I'm extremely excited about that. Now, as a strategy team and staff, we said, okay, we got four years left in this vision. What needs to occur? We identified five defining objectives. One, over the next four years, we need to develop 300 new leaders. Leaders are those who are serving in the faith family of God here at Concord using their spiritual gifts. So we need 300 of those new people serving. At the same time, we said we've got to pray that God would allow us to have the funding necessary to start four new church campuses, which would then make seven. And so we'll talk more about that as we roll into September of this year. And then last time we were together, we talked about the importance of identifying five more countries that we can be involved with internationally. So today what we want to do is drop the plow on this fourth prayer point that we have had, this defining objective, what we are pursuing, and we want to talk specifically about direct community engagement. So with that in mind, let me invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. We're in the Old Testament. One of the things that we've done through this series is look at Old Testament characters to find uh, encouragement on how we might be able to practice these particular objectives in our heart and in our life. In 2 Kings chapter 5, you're going to be introduced to somebody possibly you've never met before. And uh, looking forward to sharing with you uh, concerning that. But let me kind of set the stage for you and carry your mind back in this introduction to Jesus and his disciples. In Mark's Gospel chapter 1, we discover that Jesus was going from community to community and he was preaching the kingdom of heaven. And in the course of going from one community to another, he was walking with his disciples as well as a large crowd of people. And as they were going into this new community, there was a man that met them on the road. Now, this particular man had contracted a deadly disease known as leprosy. Leprosy is a disease of the skin that actually rots the skin off. Ultimately, the members of your body fall off. If you contract leprosy, uh, it is a sentence to die. In fact, as I studied that disease, I found out that oftentimes, whenever a person's family member had someone who contracted leprosy, they would go ahead and have a funeral for that person and then send them away. So the family considered them as good as dead when they had this particular disease of leprosy. Now the Bible teaches us in Leviticus chapter 13 that if you have the disease of leprosy, there are some things that you must do in order to let people know you have that disease so that you don't give that disease to somebody else. A couple of major things that 
lepers would have to do. One, they would have to wear tattered clothes. Now, back in the day, they wore a large T-shirt known as a tunic, but they would cut that T-shirt up so that it would wave in the wind. That was a sign that this person had leprosy. Second thing that had to occur is they would have to put their hands over their mouth anytime they saw someone in their eyesight, and they would have to scream out at the top of their lungs, unclean, unclean, unclean. This was to warn those who were walking near that leper so that they could avoid him or her and not contract the disease. Now, think about it for just a moment. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes. You're walking with Jesus from one community to the next. You're hearing powerful sermons. Even the Pharisees and Sadducees are astonished at what Jesus is preaching. And then you're going with a huge smile on your face. But then there's a man off in the distance with tattered clothes. Those clothes are waving in the wind. He has his hands cupped over his mouth. But he is not doing what he was supposed to do. He is not yelling, unclean, unclean. He's not going in the opposite direction trying to avoid the crowd. Instead, he runs right directly to where Jesus is, yelling, clean me, clean me. That's his prayer. He's calling out to Jesus. Now, again, you put yourself in the disciples' shoes for just a moment. How would you have responded? I don't know how many germaphobes we have in the room this morning. Do we have any germaphobes? I am a little bit. I ain't going to lie to you. That's one of the reasons we have all of these stations out in the foyer so you can wash your hands. It's 99.9% effective in killing all germs. What's the deal with the other? The point one is beyond me, but it drives, it keeps me up at night. You know what I'm saying? But no, no. So, so if I'm in that crowd and this leper comes, my response is to run and get away. In fact, I guarantee you that's what many people did on that day. As this leper approached Jesus, many of them would have scattered like roaches running when the lights are turned on. But Jesus doesn't run. Jesus, the Bible says, is moved in his heart with compassion. It literally means to be turned inside out with this desire to meet a need in the midst of brokenness. Jesus sees the man. He falls before him. Now, here's the thing with Jesus. Jesus could have said, be clean, and all the leprosy would have fell off. But he doesn't just simply say, be clean. Jesus does the unthinkable. Jesus moved with compassion, extends his hand out. And actually puts his hand on the shoulder of the man with leprosy. Now again, if you lived in that particular time frame, you would have realized this was taboo. You don't touch people with leprosy or else you get the disease. And yet Jesus, with an outstretched arm, the Bible says, touched the man and cleansed him. Now the reason that that stands out to me this morning is because I know the Bible teaches you and I that today we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Jesus has great compassion and he has not changed. He still has compassion towards those who are broken. Still has compassion towards those who are in need. Oftentimes you'll run into somebody and they'll say, man, I wish Jesus was still here walking on the earth with us, right? Just walking around in the flesh. But Jesus said, no, no, no. It's actually going to be better when I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to indwell you with the Holy Spirit. And then you will be my hands and feet. So the reality is Jesus uses you and I as his hands and feet to extend compassion to the communities in which we have been planted. And so we have to begin to realize that God has called us to be ambassadors. That we extend the compassion of Jesus toward those who are broken and we extend the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are in need. So we're the hands, we're the feet. One of the questions that has rocked me many times is a question I read in a book not long ago which simply said, if your church ceased to exist, would the community know it? If Concord shut its doors, would anybody in Claremont, anybody in White County, Hall County, Habersham, Lumpkin, would anybody there even notice? The fearful thing is, it could possibly shut down and nobody notice. Now, that's a problem. And so we've got to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Our goal is not simply to come together and gather and listen to preaching and that's it. When we are together here, we are the church gathered. We are being equipped, according to the scripture, check this out, to do the work of the ministry. Where does the work of the ministry happen? Outside the doors of this church. 
And you and I are the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to use you to extend an outstretched hand of compassion. And share the message of Jesus Christ to those who are in need. That's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he wants to do in my life as well. Now, you may be here and you're thinking, there's no way God can use me. Well, don't be so quick because the reality is God uses some unique people. And we're going to see that in 2 Kings chapter 5 because you and I are going to be introduced to an unnamed little girl that God used in a tremendous fashion. And I want us to find great encouragement this morning from her life, some principles that we can apply today that will make a difference in your life and what God wants to do. So with that in mind, you got your Bibles with you, say amen. 2 Kings chapter 5, stand with me in honor of God's word today. The scripture says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. And the man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a, what's your Bible say? All right, so y'all have your Bibles in front of you? So when I say, what's your Bible say, you're actually supposed to answer. What's your Bible say? That was a little bit better. Verse 2, now the Armenians had gone out in bands and had taken captive a, what's your Bible say? Little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. And then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. And then the king of Aram said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for your word. We know your calling upon us is to make disciples everywhere. God, we rejoice in the lives that have been changed, souls that have come to faith in Jesus, the difference that you're making through this community. And Father, I just pray that you would allow us, Lord, to extend a hand of compassion to the communities where you have planted us so that the gospel of Jesus might walk across the bridge of that compassion and hearts and lives can be changed. And Father, uh, speak to our hearts. We didn't come to church just so we could hear a talking head. We came because we want to hear from you. So God, speak, and we'll give you glory for it. And that's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everybody said, amen, amen. So you're seated this morning. You've got your listening God with you. Our key question today is, what lessons do I learn from a servant girl about engaging my community? What lessons can I learn from a servant girl about engaging my community. So a few things. First thing is jot this one down. Your circumstances should not overshadow your calling. Your circumstances should not overshadow your calling. Now, everybody come here for just a second. Let me set the scene for what's happening in 2 Kings 5 so we're all in the same context. There are great wars that are occurring. The Arameans are fighting against God's chosen people, the Israelites. And the Israelites are losing. They're losing rapidly, in fact. Now, it's customary in those days that if you overcame a village or you overcame a town, that you would do at least two things. One, you would take all of the possessions of the people that you had conquered back to your homeland, and you would rejoice and have a huge party and celebrate the spoils of victory. The second thing that you would often do is you would take all of the women and typically all of the children who were still alive, possibly even some of the males, but most of them would have died in battle, But you would take them captive, bring them back to your home, and you would separate them among all of those who were fighting, and those people would become servants in your house. Now the reality is, that is what occurs in the life of this little girl. And you got to put yourself in her small sandals for just a moment. This little girl lived in Israel, grew up there, she had a family. So she had a mom, she had a dad, most likely she actually had siblings. And so every single day she experienced... Just a routine, right? She'd get up in the morning, probably help mom cook the food for the day, probably run out, play with her siblings. Things were wonderful. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Armeans show up. And the Armeans attack her home village, possibly killing her parents. Some even suggest when this occurred, it would happen in the eyesight of the children. And then as a result of that, her parents were dead. Most likely her siblings had been scattered. She was taken from her home or place of security. And she was put in captivity and ultimately became the servant of Naaman's wife in their house. So again, you got to think about this 
little girl. Everything in her life, circumstantially, was turned upside down. Nothing was as it was before. Everything was radically different. And she had an opportunity to see Naaman. Naaman had a disease of leprosy. Now imagine, right? She sees the leprosy upon his skin because he would come home and he would take off his battle array. And as he would take it off every single day, that disease of leprosy would expose itself even more as leprosy would eat away at another part of his skin so she could see the decline which was happening rapidly, possibly even hear the cries and the moans of the pain that he would have been experiencing every single night as he tried to get a good night's rest. Laying there in her bed, something dramatic happened. She experienced some compassion towards him. Now the reason that's dramatic is because I'm thinking, if I'm that little girl and you ripped me out of my home, my family is gone, where I used to live, I no longer live, everything is turned upside down and you've got leprosy, I would just say God gave you that. You deserve to die. But it's interesting what happens. Did you see verse 3? The Bible says here in the Scripture, which is pretty awesome. Scripture says, she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, I bought bought for just a moment. What, What is the deal here? Well, she's moved with compassion to a point that she wants to help him. Why would she be this way? Now, here's where you got a clue in so you don't miss this truth. She's from the land of Israel. She's a part of the people of God. She would have grown up learning the law of God found in the Pentateuch, found in the Old Testament. She would have learned that her heart was to love the Lord with everything she had. She would have known that she was to love others as herself. She also would have known the promises and the desire that God had for the people of Israel. You see, God had a divine plan an assignment for the Old Testament people of Israel, and that is that they would be a blessing to the nations. Now think about it. Naaman had leprosy. As far as she concerned, she could have said, you are cursed. But the reality is something inside her remembered where she had come from. Her circumstances were not overshadowing her call to be a blessing. So she looks at Naaman, and she says to his wife, I wish he could go and see Elisha. If Elisha were to see him, Elisha, the prophet of God, would absolutely heal him. Reminded me of a um, story that I just heard about a lady who is still alive today. She's an older lady. She grew up in North Korea. North Korea is a communist country. North Korea is a country where the gospel of Jesus is not allowed to be spoken of. It's a place where Bibles, any kind of religious literature, is completely outlawed. If you have those things in your possession, the possibility of you being executed is extremely high. But this particular woman came to faith in Jesus Christ. Life radically changed. Her and some others, through happenstance, had the opportunity to cross over the border of North Korea into China. And while she was in China, she joined a group of those who were worshiping underground, because it's illegal there as well. So she was there worshiping with others, Jesus, reading scripture, Studying God's word, growing, asking God to use her. Interesting thing in China, especially over the border of North Korea, what you'll discover is that if a person in China turns in a North Korean defect, they actually receive compensation. So one individual finds out that this particular lady is a North Korean defect and turns her in for the compensation, and they take her back to North Korea and throw her into a concentration camp, a work camp. Now, the work camps in North Korea are designed to be torturous. They're designed not only to be filthy, but there's a place of disease. There's a place of hunger. It is a place of absolute death. Most people who go to the work camps breathe their last breath in the work camp. So this is the case of the lady I'm listening to share her testimony. She was tossed into this work camp. And as she was working one day, she says, the Lord spoke to her and said, I have you here for a reason. She obviously in prayer said, Lord, how could you have me in this concentration camp for a reason? What is the purpose? And she said, the Lord said, so that you can share me with the people you're working with. Now immediately she began to think, there's no way I can tell others about Jesus in this work camp. Because if I do, they will kill me on the spot. 
So she has this dilemma going on inside her heart. Now, everybody follow me say yes? Because I don't want you to miss this. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's mouthpiece to the nations. They were to be a blessing. God ultimately blessed all nations through Israel by bringing Jesus to the earth. God the Son. Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised again. And then Jesus established the New Testament church. The church is just a word that means company of the called out ones. So the church is a group of people now that God wants to use to be a blessing to the nations just as Israel was to be a blessing to the nations. And we are a blessing to the nations by showing the compassion of Jesus and sharing the message of Jesus. This woman in the North Korean concentration camp understood her calling was to share the gospel. She did not allow her circumstances ultimately to overshadow her calling. In fact, she began to say, Lord, if this is really what you want me to do, you have to make it plain and make a way. And the Lord did. One day she was standing in line to receive her one meal for the day. They would give them a small uh, tin bowl. They would be in line. And as they came to the door where they were handing out the food, they would take uh, what was known as porridge or cornmeal and put one spoonful down, just a small spoonful into that tin can. Then oftentimes they would run off and immediately begin to eat that. But as she received it that day and she was walking back to go sit down and begin to eat, the Lord said to her, share your meal with somebody. Now, you can imagine, right, there's a little bit of uh, angst in her heart because this is the only meal she's getting. And she knows the difficulty of the work camp. And she knows if she doesn't have something to eat, she could very well die of starvation. Well, she listens to the Lord. She obeys. She finds someone that she was working with. She says, I want to share this with you. You know what she's doing? She's stretching out her hand. And that individual began to eat that porridge and that individual looked at her and said why are you doing this and she immediately shared the gospel and that dude got saved you see whenever you extend compassion to those who are in need God builds a bridge upon which you can declare the message of Jesus you know what that woman reminded me of she reminded me of this servant girl who had compassion on Naaman that woman also reminded me of Jesus who had compassion upon the leper. And that woman challenged the fire out of me because you and I aren't living in a communist country. We're living in a free land where anyone can share the gospel of Jesus. And yet, oftentimes, we allow our circumstances to overshadow our calling. We say, Lord, there's no way I can share the gospel where I live. My neighbors would think I'm crazy. Lord, there's no way I can share the gospel where I work. If I do that, word will get out. I'm some kind of religious person and I'll be ignored. There's no way I can share the gospel with those that I'm hanging out with on the ball field. If I do that again, they will think I'm strange. And we just create all of these reasons why we cannot share the gospel. And then I think about this North Korean woman who could have had her head blown off immediately. And yet she obeyed God. Think about this servant girl in 2 Kings chapter 5 who also could have been executed for speaking. And yet she spoke up. If anything we learn from this servant girl, we learn we cannot allow our circumstances to overshadow our calling. Look at the preacher. Are y'all listening and say yes? This is our calling. We show the compassion of Jesus to those who are in need and we share the message of Jesus to those who are in need. We don't do one or the other, we do both. If all you do is show compassion and you never share Jesus, you just made earth a better place to go to hell from. And check it. This is our calling. This is what we do. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is what you do. If you're following Jesus, you're going to be like Jesus. If you're following Jesus, you're going to have compassion on those who are in need, and you're going to share the message of Jesus Christ. If you follow Jesus, those two things will be in your life. If they are not in your life, then you are not following Jesus. There are many people who claim to follow Jesus. Jesus even said there are many who call me Lord, Lord, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? See, if we follow Jesus then we're going to do what Jesus did. 
So please don't claim to follow Jesus if you're not involved in the things that Jesus does. You confuse people. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, don't allow your circumstances to overshadow your calling. God has divinely planted you where you live, where you work, and where you play. And God put you there on purpose to be a missionary for his sake. And if you're not being a missionary for his sake, you are missing the point for why God saved you to begin with. Your salvation was not simply to carry you to heaven. Salvation hit you on its way to somebody else. And God wants to use you. Don't miss that. You feel like your life is empty as a Christian? You're like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. Share the gospel and show the compassion of Jesus. You will find your cup begins to overflow. Second truth, jot it down. Your age should not determine your difference. Your age should not determine the difference that you can make. Now, I love this one, right? I probably should say it the way it's up there. Your age shouldn't dictate the difference you can make. The Bible says, verse 2, again, Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. You might want to underline that little phrase, a little girl. Now this stood out to me, right? Because I'm reading this, I'm like, all right, this is a little girl. How old is this little girl? Well, her age obviously is not found here in the Scripture. So I began to look and say, okay, how did people classify females in that day? And the interesting thing that I found out is that often in Israelites' history, even in the days of Jesus, when a girl turned 12, she was considered a woman. That was also the time frame when marriage would be out in front. Good night, that's early, isn't it? But it was the custom of the day, so it was very normal. So if you think about it, 12 years old is when you become a woman. And here in this scripture, it doesn't just say it was a girl. It says it was a little girl. So how old was this little girl? Good. Well, she was under the age of 12. Somebody even argues she was around 7 or 8. 7 or 8. Can you imagine this little girl in this house of this powerful man named Naaman who's dying of leprosy and she's like, oh, I wish he could go see Elisha, the prophet of God. Come on now. She's just a little girl. And yet God wanted to use her. You know what that says to me? That says to me, it doesn't matter what your age is this morning, God desires to use you. No matter how young you are, you can be in elementary school, as long as you know Jesus, he wants to use you. you be in middle school, high school, you can be in college. Hey, listen, you can be a senior adult. That means old. And God still wants to use you. But you know what often happens? Some individuals in the context of a Baptist church will grow up and they turn around 65, maybe 70, and they're like, well, I'm done. I've done my duty. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy. Please. That is not God's call for your life. If you're still breathing, He still has use for you. When He's done with you, He'll take you. Come on now. I went to two funerals yesterday. Krista sang in one, I preached in the other. And there was a man who got up to preach. He was 92 years old. You know what I loved about him? I'd never even seen the guy before. I loved the fact he shared the gospel. I was like, look at this dude, 92 years old. He was all getting fired up too. I'm talking about like, he was Pentecostal. But he was getting excited. This is no joke. 92-year-old man, frail. He probably weighed 100 pounds, maybe a little more. But he got up there. He just said, I ain't lying. Lift his leg up and did this and said, glory to God. And I thought, when I'm 91, if I can just do this, I'll be saying glory to God. Doesn't matter your age. That's one thing I love about Concord. There are people in this fellowship who are senior adults who realize God can still use them. And God is using them. Don't miss out on what God wants to do in your life. Don't allow your age to determine the difference that you can make. Third statement, jot this one down. This one's huge. And I love this one. Your trust must be in God to make the difference. Your trust must be in God to make the difference. Now, what happened to Naaman, this cat with the leprosy? Uh, Well, let's kind of jump into the story and see what went down. We'll jump to verse 9 in 2 Kings 5. Y'all got it there? Say amen. All right, verse 9, the Bible says, So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him. 
saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you will be clean. Naaman was furious. He went away and said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over uh, the place and cure the leper. Are not Abner and Farfar, that is how you say it, I think, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And then his servants came and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now, eyeball to eyeball. Let me kind of speed this puppy up here because I want you to hear this, right? This little girl pointed Naaman to the prophet Elisha. You and I have an extremely similar calling. You and I could go to those who are broken in the disease of sin, which, by the way, is much more deadly than leprosy. Sin will carry a person to hell. And yet you and I can go, and we don't point them to a prophet named Elisha. We point them to the final prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about what happened. Naaman shows up. He's at Elisha's door, knocks on the door. Elisha doesn't even come out. He just stays in the house. He's like, just go tell him to wash in the Jordan. So Naaman's like, what? I I just knew he was going to come out here and be like, be clean, O ye. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Pretty confident, not the Lord. But anyway, so <laughs> I had other things I wanted to sing. So anyway, so, so that's it. Be clean. But, but he doesn't do that. He's like, nope, go to the Jordan, drop seven times, come back up, you be clean. He's like, the Jordan, that place is muddy. Why would I go to that nasty river? There's two other rivers I could go to. He goes off in a rage. The message that Elisha shared with him in order for him to be cleansed was a ludicrous message. Well, finally, he listened. You and I have a message that is ludicrous. Matter of fact, Paul the Apostle calls the message that you and I are to share with others foolish. Think about it, right? You go to somebody like, hey man, uh, you know we're all, we're all sinners, right? I mean, everybody's sinned. We've all committed sin. You could be like, you ever told a lie before? Like, yes, well, you're a liar. That's sin. You, you ever stole something? Yeah, if you're a thief, that's sin. You ever uh, been angry? Yeah, Jesus said that's murder in God's courtroom. You ever lusted after somebody who wasn't your spouse? Yes, well, that's adultery in God's courtroom, right? So you have broken the laws of God and you're a sinner. So you share that with somebody. They're like, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. I said, but here's the good news. God loves you even though you're a sinner. So much so that, you know what he did? No, I don't know what he did. What he did? 2,000 years ago, God sent his son Jesus to the earth. Born of a virgin. Born of a what? Born of a virgin. Born of a what? That can't happen. Why are you telling me this? This is ridiculous. No, 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 it gets better. Listen, born of a virgin to ensure his purity. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet he is without sin. He grew up, never had a wrong thought, never spoke a foul word, never argued with his siblings before. Can you imagine, by the way, Mary's life? She hears the siblings in there arguing, and she walks into the room. Jesus is in there, and she's like, I know it wasn't you. He's perfect. This perfect man began to share the message of the kingdom of heaven, but the people hated him. And ultimately, they took him, and they put him on a cross, and they killed him. They did what? Yes, they killed him on the cross. Yes, why was he dying? He was dying there for your sin and for my sin. The penalty that we deserve is death for our sin, but Jesus died in our place. Then he was buried, and then three days later, he got up from the grave. He did what? He got up from the grave, yet he had a body. He walked around, and he showed himself to people. Fifty days, in fact. And then he ascended into the heavens in the clouds with the disciples looking on. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And he said, I'm coming again to claim my own. Have you been watching some sci-fi movies lately? Because that sounds ridiculous. Naaman was told, go wash into Jordan River. That sounds ridiculous. But he went to the river and he came up clean. And when a person goes to the fountain where the blood of Jesus Christ was spilt on the cross and by faith believes that his death paid for their penalty and trust in the resurrection, they are clean. 
That's the message. And I know people get furious about it just like Naaman did. I know people think it's ridiculous just like Naaman did. But how many of you know, once you go to the cross, you find out it really isn't all that ridiculous. The message of the Lord Jesus Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are born again, it is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, listen, listen. God's called you to display compassion. Directly engage the community where he has planted you. And when you display compassion and you share the message of Jesus Christ, you're going to discover that God has the power to redeem lives. Listen, you weren't saved to sit at church. Yeah, driving me crazy. You weren't saved to come and sit down and just listen to preaching. You were saved so you could become a part of the kingdom of heaven and then go out to those who were still in their death of sin and trespasses and tell them how to be saved. That's why you were saved. So I'm not real sure what you're doing. But if all your Christian life is, is I come to church and sit down and listen to preaching and I'll sing the song if I know the words. Really? That's why God saved you from hell? Seriously? Let's think a little deeper about what God really wants you to do. And I want to challenge you. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you need to begin to think intentionally like a missionary and say, where I live are there people who don't know Jesus. What am I going to do about it? Listen, listen. Not what's the preacher going to do about it. No, no, no. What are you going to do about it? God puts you there. Because he wants to you. Where are you work? Who doesn't know Jesus? What are you going to do about it? Where you spend your extracurricular activities. People who don't know Jesus, what are you going to do about it? One of the days ahead with God's help and our prayers and our pursuit to Him, we're going to ask God that He would use every church campus of Concord to think strategically about how best to engage the community with the gospel. Because I want it to be said in northeast Georgia, Man, we need concord around here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the compassion that you display to us in Jesus. And Father, we pray that we would express that same compassion to others. And Father, I pray that all of us would really begin to think strategically about where we live, work, and play and how you can use us. And Father, for those who are here today who already know you, Perhaps they have kind of stepped off the path of showing compassion and sharing the message of Jesus. They're not engaging the community where you have planted them. Stir up in their hearts the desire that you had. The same desire that you displayed when you saw the man with leprosy. And you stretched out your hand. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, I know the message sounds crazy, but I have been there. And many others can testify to it as well. Their lives have been changed. Let me invite you to come to faith in Jesus. Scripture says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, would you just pray something like this in your heart as I pray out loud? Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. So today I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the resurrection. Now help me to live a life unashamed of who you are. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if that's the prayer of your heart, the first step of obedience is baptism. We'd love to set up a date in the future for you to be baptized. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand to our feet here in just a moment and begin to sing. So if you just prayed with me and gave your life to Christ, I want you to come forward. I'll be here in the front, others as well. We want to pray for you, set you up an opportunity to be baptized in the days ahead. Now listen, don't be ashamed, right? Don't be looking around saying who else is going to come. You just come if God's dealing with your heart. And then secondly, let me invite you, if you're here today and you sense this is where God wants you to plug in, you want to join us in the mission of making disciples everywhere, then I'm going to invite you to come this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to live it out. Put your hand upon those who need to come today. And we'll give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. While we sing, you come this morning.